Chapter thirty five of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Here and there in Stambul. One must cross the Golden Horn to Stambul to feel that he is at last in the Constantinople of his imagination, the meeting place of East and West, the great center of Mohammedanism, and the heart of the old Turkish Empire. In its narrow, winding streets, Armenians, Persians, Greeks, syrians jews turks dervishes and priests of every confession jostle each other and one may hear almost every language and dialect spoken in the bazaars the wares of the east far and near compete with goods from the mills of manchester and the factories of birmingham the bazaars of constantinople are the most famous of the world the two best known are the egyptian bazaar and the grand bazaar both of which are in stambul the egyptian bazaar forms a street three hundred and fifty feet long and forty feet wide in which are set out for sale coffee gums dates spices perfumes opium nuts and dye stuffs the grand bazaar has ninety odd streets and houses and something like four thousand shops but suppose we go and see for ourselves what it is like we cross the golden horn pass up the street from the galata bridge turn to the right and are soon in the maze of the great market it is really a city within a city with arcaded streets alleys lanes and fountains all enclosed within walls and covered over with a curving roof broken by a hundred cupolas we enter one of the tunnel-like streets it is dimly lighted by windows high up on the curve of the arch the walls are yellow but the arched roof is stenciled with blue and the whole has a cool effect there are festoons of rugs and hundreds of hanging lamps this tunnel is floored with cobbles though there are others paved with asphalt in each of the little cells looking out on the street sits a merchant waiting among his goods for customers there is one with his turbaned head bent over a book on his lap he is reading the koran i read my bible sometimes but never while waiting for business i wonder how many american merchants snatch the moments between sales to con the testaments here is the leather bazaar with hundreds of merchants each in his own cave-like establishment on the walls and overhead hang great sheets of fine leather black white and yellow in the next tunnel is a shoe bazaar the cells of which have shelves filled with red black and yellow shoes and slippers in spaces often not more than four by six feet shoemakers are sitting each with a stump-like stool before him pounding leather or sewing away one little turkish boy in a red fez bows to me and laughs as i write we go on and strike a cross street filled with dry goods farther along there are streets of rugs and one that fairly reeks with attar of roses and other perfumes there are streets of shops selling nothing but jewelry gold tiaras set with diamonds gorgeous belt buckles encrusted with sapphires and emeralds and brooches of pigeon blood rubies one would think the wealth of the world had been shoveled into baskets and brought here for sale in this jewelry street and others of the main tunnels several of the merchants have plate glass windows and up-to-date counters western methods seem to be coming in gradually some of the finest stores are not visible from the street one may crawl through a hole in the wall climb up narrow stairs and find a room filled with the treasures of aladdin here are jewels that have been worn by the beauties of the harems gold and silver articles from russia and rugs that are worth as much as the gems there are antiques also a diplomat friend of mine who was with me in one of these stores today brought a little sarcophagus of alabaster which i venture is two thousand years old it is about twice the size of a cigar box and was once used to hold the ashes of some beloved dead experienced shoppers learn to avoid the greeks the armenians and the jews who send out men to entice people to the shops where they sell so-called antiques everywhere merchants and customers are discussing prices the word bazaar means to bargain and this market deserves its name there are no fixed prices for anything so that each purchase involves a contest after the sunset chant of the musen calling the faithful to prayer the bazaars of stambul are deserted save for the watchmen guarding the wares hidden behind iron doors on friday the moslem sabbath all the turkish stalls will be closed the jews will do no business on saturday 
and the christian greeks and armenians will shut up shop on sunday as we leave the bazaar we notice the public letter writers in the shade near a mosque here is a well-dressed turk of middle age dictating a business letter to a spectacled old scribe education is nominally compulsory in turkey but since only one in twenty-four of the population attends school illiteracy is so usual that it is considered no disgrace even for the well-to-do at the shallow basins in the mosque courtyard worshippers are washing their hands arms nostrils and ears according to the instructions of the koran before going into prayer to the moslem cleanliness is not merely next to godliness but it is a part of godliness there are more than one hundred turkish baths in constantinople every important mosque has its bath and some mosque baths have been endowed so that the poor may enjoy this luxury passing on we pause for a moment at a turkish restaurant where the food is laid on tables set along the street like all the old-fashioned turks the customers are eating with their fingers for this reason napkins are an important item among their people finely embroidered towels and napkins are often used many of which are bought by the globe trotters and sent back home as decorations the ends are sometimes worked in fine patterns of gold and silver thread, and some of the pieces sell for five and ten dollars each. As we watch the restaurant keeper serving meat or fish with his hands, plunging them into one pot after another without even wiping them in between, we decide not to patronize his place. But farther on, we do take a drink of coffee while we sit watching the street life of Stamboul. Turkish coffee is as thick as maple syrup, and has a rich dark brown color it is served without cream in tiny cups set in holders of gold silver or brass filigree work i often see the cooks at the out-of-door eating places preparing it the roasted coffee is pounded in a mortar and several spoonfuls of the powder mixed with boiling water the mixture is then held over the fire in a long-handled pot being shaken from time to time as a thick scum rises to the surface before it boils more water is added after which it is allowed to boil and is then ready for serving sugar is added and sometimes a little musk coffee cigarettes and preserves sometimes of rose leaves are given callers at turkish homes and it is not uncommon in the bazaars for a merchant to have coffee brought in before he proceeds with a sale the turks are fond of sweets and often serve them after each one of eight or nine dishes sherbets are popular and the ice cream vendor does a big business in the streets of stamboul great quantities of the fig paste of smyrna are sold here too while some of the most delicious candies i have ever tasted i have bought at the stamboul end of the galata bridge i am not surprised that the mixture of fig paste and nougat is called turkish delight in his home the old-fashioned turk does not use a dining table but eats from a tray of about the diameter of a wash tub in the center of the tray is the hot dish of the meal surrounded by the salt cellars the pepper dishes the pickles and the other condiments and appetizers the turks like so much at a meal in the village each person has his own spoon with which he helps himself to the thick soup pilaf is to the turk what macaroni is to the italian or rice to the japanese it is made of rice cooked with butter and is by no means an unsavory dish it is served at all the hotels here being as popular as curry and rice in india fire has always been one of the great scourges of constantinople where it is estimated it destroys every decade more than twenty five thousand homes on the galata tower in pira and similar towers in the other sections watchmen keep a lookout day and night as soon as they see signs of a fire warnings are sent out and soon the volunteer firemen are on the way to put out the blaze the volunteer firemen of constantinople are unique their organizations are made up of venturesome and more or less disreputable young men of all races stripped almost to the skin bareheaded and barefooted a hooting squad dashes through the streets on a dead run in the lead is a man swinging a brass wand and behind him come the firemen carrying a hand pump mounted on a wooden box with two poles at each end resting on the men's shoulders as they are not paid by the city they drive a hard bargain with the man whose property is threatened and they have the reputation of helping themselves to what they want 
the firemen are superstitious about the use of sea water which they say makes a fire burn more fiercely than ever and the city water supply is most inadequate i dare say though that by my next visit the volunteer firemen will be as much a thing of the past as are the dogs that were so prevalent in the streets when i was in constantinople before i am told that the turks will shortly introduce modern firefighting apparatus and that the city government took over the apparatus installed by the allies in pira this reminds me of an incident that occurred when kaiser wilhelm and abdul hamid the second were such cronies in return for some big concessions from the turkish sultan the kaiser presented him with a modern fire engine for his city the turks admired its polished brass and shiny nickel so much that they put it in their museum and roped it off from the touch of sightseers the imperial museum in stambul is an archaeological treasure house with enough broken statues to fill several rooms of the british museum and with sarcophagi that would be considered interesting even in athens or rome it has the collections made by dr schliemann from his excavations at troy and also some of the finds of the archaeologists at babylon and in assyria and mesopotamia the most wonderful of the sarcophagi in the museum is that of alexander the great it was dug up at sidon not far from tyre and is supposed to have been made four hundred years before christ some of you remember the jingle you recited as schoolboys how big was alexander pa the people call him great was he so big that he could stand on some tall steeple high and while his feet were on the ground his hands could touch the sky oh no my child about as large as i or uncle james twas not his stature made him great but the greatness of his name well i am glad to be able to settle at last the height of the great macedonian monarch i have gone over his sarcophagus with a tape measure and can give you its dimensions inside and out it is a huge block of pentelic marble six feet in height the interior would allow alexander to be full nine feet tall or nine inches shorter than goliath of gath another of the sarcophagi is that of tabnith king of sidon who reigned in palestine about seven hundred b c in the days of the phoenicians the inscription reminds one of the epitaph on shakespeare's grave in the church at stratford on avon blessed be the man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones tabnith's inscription reads i tabnith king of sidonians lie at rest in this tomb whoever thou art who discover it do not i adjure thee open my coffin and do not disturb me for there is neither silver nor gold nor treasure beside me i rest alone in this tomb such an act is an abomination in the eyes of ashtoreth and if thou openest my coffin and disturbest me mayest thou have no posterity with the living under the sun and no resting place among the dead king tabnith was a liar who when the tomb was opened his embalmed mummy was found surrounded by jewels and precious stones which are now shown here in glass cases the mummy is in a good state of preservation End of chapter 35